Good morning, church family. As we begin uh, our worship together, if you'll notice that behind me there are a bunch of people wearing these t-shirts, and we just returned from Denver, Colorado last night after having been there for a week, and they did a lot, a lot, a lot of work, worked at a food bank, bank that we partnered with and uh, gave out food to homeless in downtown Denver, uh, worked on several houses, uh, did tile work, painted a house, cleared out a jungle. Did you know that there was a jungle in Denver, Colorado? Well, we found it, and it is no longer there, thanks to these guys. Lots and lots of blood, sweat, and tears were poured in as we devoted ourselves to 168 hours of worship this past week. There are a bunch more than this, but I'd like to call attention to the other folks that are out here wearing these Navy shirts. If you went with us and you're not up there, would you stand? Yeah, thank y'all a bunch. Thank you a bunch. Couldn't have done it without them. If they look sleepy, then you might keep them awake during the sermon because they've been up a lot. Uh, you can just punch them. Um, in this 168 worship week, uh, we've learned a lot about what it means to be worshipers all the time, even when we get those few moments of rest. So as we worked and as we served and as we sang and as we led worship and as we worshiped together in corporate worship, all of that was worship. And so we invite you to let this be the launching pad for you this week, that let this 11 o'clock hour be the first hour of worship for you this week, and the rest of the 167 hours that are left, devote that to worship of our Almighty God as well. Let's start right now. Stand with us.
morning, church family. We're so glad that you all could join with us today. Um, if you are a guest with us this morning, we're especially glad that you are um, joining us. Um, have you ever been so happy for 78 degrees in June? My word. It was, uh, I was sweating like a sinner in church yesterday, man. Um, but uh, we're so glad that you guys were here. Um, if you are a guest with us you're, and it's your first time here, if you wouldn't mind taking out your smartphone, smart device, anything like that, um, you can go to our app store and you can download the First Baptist app. Um, and if you will download that, um, you can pull that up um, and you can go to a section called uh, I'm New. Um, and if you will click that link, it'll take you to an online form that you can fill out. Um, and it will just allow us uh, to reach out to you, contact you, um, and we would love to get you on mission with us here at First Baptist as we continue to worship, transform, and serve right here in the community of Lubbock and the community around the globe. Also, um, if you're a full-time member with us, you can go ahead and uh, take, out your, uh, take out your smartphone and share the live stream of the service on Facebook using the hashtag expectations. We'd love for you to do that. It gives your Facebook audience an idea of where you're spending your time this morning and how you're spending your time. And at this time, why don't you go ahead and turn to the people around you and shake their hand and greet them.
Hey, thank you guys. Appreciate y'all leading us this morning in worship. Let's open our Bibles, our smart devices, whatever you need this morning to uh, follow along to uh, Matthew's Gospel in chapter 21. I want us to focus on some... uh, Passages that are a bit unusual in our series. We're still in this uh, conversations that matter. And for the past uh, 10 or 11 messages, it's been private conversations that Jesus had with with individuals about the kingdom of God, about the life of, of faith. And, and I'll be the first to admit this is a little bit different uh, conversation because he's not having a conversation with a person. He's having a conversation with a, with a tree. And it's not really a conversation. It's kind of a one-sided conversation. It's just Jesus doing the talking. And the talking is just a curse that is pronounced upon this this fig tree. And so that's what I want us to look at this this morning in our time is Matthew chapter 21 in verses 18 through 22. I'm sure you've all heard the expression before. It's an idiomatic expression, barking up the wrong tree. It has to do, and it's related to, a misplaced emphasis. I know when we hear that that expression, barking up the wrong tree, we think immediately of a a tree, of a dog that has chased a certain prey, usually a squirrel up a a tree, and there's the dog there barking up this tree. And unbeknownst to the the dog, the, the squirrel or the prey has jumped to another tree. And so he's barking up, up the wrong tree. He's expending his, his energy in the wrong place. It's not going to have the desired end that, that he thinks that it, that it will. Well, we do the same thing in life. We, we start pursuing things, chasing things, and then uh, we find out that, that really we've expended our energies barking up, up the wrong tree. That we were sold a bill of goods, that if we would chase this in life, we would have happiness, fulfillment, a sense of mission and purpose in life. And then at some stage, at some point in season in life, it dawns upon us, I've just been barking up a tree. That what I thought was there isn't really there at all. Well, nowhere is this more true. As I look at the words of Jesus, I've come to the conclusion that, that this is nowhere more true than in the life of faith that there is a very real possibility that that in the exercising of your faith expression that that you can expend a great deal of energy barking up the wrong tree. That becomes evident in this passage of of Scripture uh, because from the very outset, one of the things that Jesus makes very clear to us is that you're barking up the wrong tree when you think that you can have faith without fruit. You're barking up the wrong tree, whatever you think, that that you can be a person of faith and yet there be no fruit coming forth from from your life. That's really the issue that that Jesus has with this fig tree. Notice as the narrative begins, it says now in the the morning when he was returning to the city, that is, he's returning to Jerusalem. Now in the morning when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. Underscore that in your mind, if not in your Bible. Leaves only. That's all he saw were leaves only. He was expecting fruit. He came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, no longer shall there be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Now, of course, what we have here is an acted out parable. Jesus, this account that we've just read, comes on the heels of of Jesus turning over the tables of of the money changers. This is an enacted parable, if you will, of Jesus' judgment against the nation of Israel, their hypocrisy, their failures as as the people of God and what the people of God are, are supposed to be. And really, I think this is an expression of mercy, not unlike when Jesus cast the legion of demons into the swine and they ran off the cliff. Instead of judging individuals, he's judged a herd of swine. He expressed his displeasure Uh, in a herd of swine. Now he's expressed his displeasure with Israel uh, by using a tree as as an example, withholding that judgment. That's what mercy and compassion does. But it's a very picturesque thing that we have here of how the nation of Israel, the people of God, have failed to live up to what it is to be a, a holy people. If we are anything at all, we're not to be a religious people as much as we are a fruit bearing people. There's always been that, that, ex, 
expectation for those who would be the people of God. You look back in the Old Testament, you look at the minor and major prophets. There is always this message from the prophet to the people of God that, that you're, you're a unique people, you're a distinctive people. I have called you out. I have separated you from everyone else. There is something about you as the people of God that is to separate you. You're to be a countercultural kind of people. You hold to a different kinds of values and beliefs and standards. You aspire to more. You aspire to live a life that is, that is pleasing to the Father, but you're not doing that, the prophets would say. And if, and if you don't repent, the judgment of God is going to come against you. Well, over and over and over, minor prophets, major prophets, that is the theme. You're the people of God, act like it. If you don't repent, the judgment of God is going to come against you. Of course, the people do not repent. Judgment is forthcoming, but then the message of the prophet becomes one of hope, restoral, restoring, uh, renewal beginning again. That's the nature of the mess. That's the cycle over and over and over again in the prophets. Scripture is always clear that there is something about us. There is something about us who call ourselves believers that, that desire to please God. There is always something about us that is to be unique and, and, distinct, and distinctive. And it's not just being religious. Because Jesus had certain expectations. When he went up to this fig tree, all he saw were leaves. In other words, all he saw was was the illusion of of a tree that was pretending to bear fruit. All he really saw was, was the show. And if we're not careful in this life of faith that, that we embrace, it, be, it, be, it can become something that's not really a faith expression. It's just a religious expression. It's very easy to fool ourselves that because I go to church, because I, I use religious jargon, because I read my Bible, even Bible, even study the scriptures, even praying, those things can just be illusions. Even those things that Christians ought to do, go to church, pray, read your Bible. Even those things can become illusions, just leaves, trying to give the impression that, that our lives are bearing fruit. That's why I've never considered myself a religious person. I always taken back a bit when people say, oh, well, you're religious. No, I, I, I'm not religious. I've, I've never considered myself religious. What I am is a person of faith. And I want it to, to look different, and, and I want to go to church, and I want to study my Bible, and I want to pray, but, but those things are not an end in and of themselves. Those are a means to an end. And hopefully what what those things will accomplish in my life, what we should desire, all of us as followers of Christ, what we should desire is that these things are going to lead to fruit bearing, not not just leaves, not not just show. See, that's the standard by which we have to measure our lives and our faith journey. How are we maturing? As I look at my life, as I consider where I am from even where I was a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, five years ago, as I, as I look back and I progress this, this lifeline to where I am now, would, it, would I say that I've grown, that, that fruit is becoming more evident in my life? You know, that, that's our standard of measure. You know, it, it's always disconcerting to me when it seems that the prevalence of many pulpits today is just to decry how bad the world is. All oh, things are terrible. All oh, things are just going to hell in a handbasket. Well, that's the way the world's always been. The expectation of godly living isn't on the world. It's on the, it's on the people of God. 1 Corinthians 5.12, the apostle Paul would say, as he's perplexed, you know, the the Corinthians kind of embraced a a lifestyle like the culture in which they found themselves. And kind of the the going mentality was, well, this this is the way everybody lives. These are kind of the norms and standards of the day. And Paul says, no, 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 listen, you're, you're the distinctive people of God. You're called out to be a different kind of people. Paul said, what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Paul says, I could care less in, what, in what, how the outsiders are behaving. The burden of Christian living is upon you, the church. Even Peter would say in 1 Peter 4.12 4, or in chapter 4 there, he, he would say that, that the burden of, 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 of Christian living 
belongs to the people of God. He says, let the judgment of God begin in the household of God. And so pulpits are derelict. I mean, there's nothing easier than generating a bunch of amens than standing up here and ranting and raving about how bad the world is. I mean, that's playing to the crowd. Easy to get cheap cheap amens throwing stones from the public square at people about how bad they are. But the burden of Christian living belongs alone to the church. Am I bearing fruit? Am I more engaged? Am I more vested in the kingdom of God today than I was five years ago? See, we hold up the wrong standards for measuring my faith. Well, have I been reading my Bible every day? Have I been going to church like I'm supposed to? Am I praying? That's the wrong standard. Those are not the end in and of itself. Those are a means to an end. Here's the standard of measure, whether fruit is being bored out in your life. Paul would write in Galatians chapter 5, listen to this, regarding the fruit of the Spirit, fruit bearing, the Spirit of Christ being made manifest in us. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, Self-control against such things, there is no law. Are those things being played out in our life more and more as I'm growing in my faith? Otherwise, you're just, if, if you just point to your prayer life, if you just point to Bible study, if you just point to your occasional church attendance, listen, you're barking up a wrong tree. And all you've got instead of faith is institutional, cultural religion. There's a difference. Jesus makes it very clear also that we're barking up the wrong tree, not only when we think we can have faith that bears no fruit, but also we're, we're barking up the wrong tree as the people of God, because this, this is what this is about, the expectations of those who would be the people of God. We're barking up the wrong tree when our vision is limited. When our vision is limited. Because that, that's what Jesus is speaking to in the life of these disciples. That's what he desires for them, to have an expanded vision of the kingdom of God, an expanded kind of hope of the possibilities that might be of what God is desiring to do in the world. He said in verse 20, seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus answered and said to them, truly I say to you, if, that's a big if, If you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. You know, I'm intrigued by that first clause. We're having seen what had happened to the tree. The disciples were amazed, the text says. Now, understand the context of this. We've just seen the the triumphal entry. You can look back in your your Bible. This is the triumphal entry. This is following the triumphal entry. We're in the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. And you think about three years, all the things that these disciples have seen. Think about everything that they've observed, what they have been witness to for the past three years. I mean, they've seen Lazarus raised from the dead, so they've seen the dead resurrected. They've seen sight given to the blind. They've seen hearing given to the deaf. They've seen, they've seen the lame walking. They've seen water turned into wine. Now, I don't know about you, but on the grand scale of things, of, of having seen all of that for the past three years, that, I mean, th- those are pretty good experiences, I mean, those are pretty confirming things that you've seen. And now all of a sudden, because of a fig tree, they were amazed. They still don't get it. They're still small-minded. You know what? If If the disciples of Jesus, we always ascribe way too much to these disciples, we always think because they're called disciples, there's some, kind, they, you know, there's some kind of saints that are way above us. That's not true. That just shows you haven't been reading your Bible. Because if the disciples have modeled anything at all for us, what they have modeled is little faith. They model for us what little faith 
looks like. So even after three years, their mind is still small. They still do not think in terms of possibilities. They think only in terms of this trying to control God in this this little box of how God has to perform in the normalcy of everyday operations. Never mind for three years. They've seen him usurping the normal operation of things. But if they model anything at all, they model little faith. What he wants is disciples who are confident who don't doubt what God is doing, that God is doing something, that that God can act in a way that is beyond my circumstances, that is beyond my situation. How much confidence do we really have when we think of the things of God? You know, I've committed my adult life to teaching and preaching the word of God. I, I have a very full confidence. I never lack in confidence. When I stand before you and I'm preaching the word of God, there is not a doubt in my mind. I am fully confident that when the word of God is taken in by someone, when they believe it and respond and say, that's what I want my life to be about, I am fully confident that the proclaimed word of God can transform human lives you don't ever have to wonder does Bobby really believe that there is an unwavering conviction that what the gospel is able to accomplish in a person's life is transformational and Jesus says if you speak to that mountain right there now the reality is I don't spend a lot of time talking to mountains neither do you but what we all do is we spend a tremendous amount of time talking about the mountains in our lives. And when we talk about our mountains, our obstacles, our roadblocks, do we do it with a confidence of what God can do beyond the circumstances as I'm seeing them and I'm responding to them? You really can't sell it if you don't believe it. If, if, if doubt, and listen, we, we live in a culture that, that kind of honors doubt, especially in an academic community where, where doubting is kind of revered and given its place and, and kind of lends itself to the pursuit of creativity. I get that. We even have a disciple who doubts, doubting Thomas. But what Jesus is speaking to here, when, when, when you see in the teachings of Jesus, when you see him allude to doubt, When he's talking about doubt and teaching about doubt, he's talking about people who live as if God doesn't even exist. And he's saying to those disciples then, and he's saying to us now, I need you to live in a bigger world. The world you're going to be set in, the world that, where I've placed you, it's going to be a world that is driven by circumstances. That's how it's going to respond. I need you to think bigger. I need you to have a vision that thinks in terms of the impossible being possible. Some of you may have seen it this, this spring. It was an ESPN special. A young man by the name Craig Cunningham played, for the, played hockey for the... Tucson Roadrunners went into sudden cardiac arrest right before the opening face-off back in a game in in November. It happened to be during the the national anthem, so all the the training staff of both teams were out on the ice standing there. So when he went into sudden cardiac arrest, he he had immediate help. For 30 minutes, these first responders performed resuscitation efforts, 30 minutes to get get him from the eyes to get him to the emergency room, nonstop 30 minutes. The attending and all the emergency room staff at, at the hospital there in Tucson, they continued the resuscitation efforts with seemingly no, no success. 82 minutes from the time that, that he fell on the ice, sudden cardiac arrest, from the effort of first responders to the hospital staff, 82 minutes had passed. There was a, a renowned cardiac, cardio, uh, thoracic cardio surgeon in Tucson by the name of Zane Calpe. He's an MD, PhD. 
He had been called, told the situation as he was making him, as he was going to the hospital, as he was in the route, hospital staff called him and said, we've been 82 minutes into resuscitation. Do you want us to stop and make the call? He said, absolutely not. Do not stop. He said, I'm five minutes out. He went into the waiting area and met Craig Cunningham's mother and said to her, are you Heather? Craig's mom, she said, yes. He said, I'm Zane Calpy. And he said, I want you to know that I love my job and I'm really, really, really good at it. And I will save your son. Well, he did survive. It's a powerful story, but I was captivated in, in the telling of, of the story and reading of that account Dr. Calpe said that when his team kept wanting to make the call and he refused, I was captivated by Dr. Calpe's statement. He said, apparently, I still have people on my team that do not believe in the impossible. Jesus is trying to build a team here. I need you to believe in the impossible, in a world that is hopeless, in a world that is filled with despair. I need you to model something different. I need you as my disciples to be a people of vision. I need you to believe in those things that look impossible. Otherwise, you're just barking up the wrong tree. The final thing that Jesus says is that we're barking up the wrong tree. When in our praying, we pray without confidence. A part of this big vision people and a part of this big belief, a part of this believing the impossible is praying with confidence as well. In fact, Jesus would express it this way in verse 22. And he said, and all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Okay, all, all things. Let's, let's break this down here because we're all troubled by this verse, this statement of Jesus, and it's made in other places as, as well. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. You know, the reality is, is every one of us have prayed difficult prayers, haven't we? We've all been driven to prayer because of circumstances in life, whether it was a, a diagnosis of disease or there was death, or there was economic hardship. The scenarios are widespread. All the things that, that, that create panic and angst and, and we, we, we pray desperately. We pray for the, for the circumstances to change, for things to be corrected, for that, for that particular problem that has initiated our prayer, we, we pray that, that it'll change, that it'll go away, and then, and then after we have prayed that prayer of desperation, we muster up all the faith that we can, don't we? We try to conjure up, muster up, convince ourselves, I'm claiming it in the name of Jesus. By faith, I'm believing this, this request to be true. And then to find ourselves disappointed. Because it wasn't answered the way we, we asked it. And we're disappointed because I, I read a verse like verse 22 where it says, I can ask all things in prayer believing and you will receive it. And the fact is I, I didn't get it. I didn't receive it. It didn't happen. Well, is it? Is it really a belief issue and a, a faith issue? I mean, that, that's, that's what the proponents of the health, wealth, prosperity gospel want you to think. If you've got financial hardships as a, as a believer, if you have health issues as a believer, if, if you're not prospering the way that God wants you to prosper, never mind that the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. This, this is a very westernized turn of theology. But if you've got health problems, you have financial problems, well, that, that's... That's a faith issue. You don't, 
You just don't have enough faith. If you believed strong enough, you'd have what you want. You know, the the intriguing thing about the health, the proponents of health, wealth, prosperity gospel is that is that they eventually die. Apparently they didn't have enough faith themselves. You know, they had some health problems. They died. And what what are we going to say about Paul? Paul prayed three times that the thorn in his flesh might be removed. We're going to say Paul didn't didn't have enough, Paul didn't have enough faith. Paul, if you just believed hard enough, that would have happened. The thorn in the flesh would have gone away. Are we going to say Jesus didn't have enough faith that he didn't believe enough? When he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, that he prayed that, that this cup might pass from him? So we, he didn't get his request, so we, we're going to say that Jesus didn't have enough faith, didn't believe enough? Well, of course not. So that, that's really not what the verse means. When Jesus says and utilizes this word believing, And all things you ask in prayer, believing. It's a belief that that sees beyond the temporal benefit. It's a belief that that God is working in ways that that go beyond my present circumstances. My my present tense circumstances and my fears may, may may have driven me to my knees to pray. But hopefully as as a mature believer and follower of Christ, when I pray believing, even when that was initiated by my present tense circumstances, I I, I have the kind of of belief that goes beyond any temporal benefit. I believe with confidence and conviction that God is doing something beyond my circumstances. Even though my circumstances may, may have been what what led me to pray initially, my my believing is not that that this is going to be that this is going to be you know changed into what I want it to be changed into. That that circumstance is going to change anyway. Whether God does it or not, circumstances always change. But my prayer of believing in all things is that God is doing something bigger than the eye has seen that is bigger than has even entered into our mind. That's the kind of robust richness of faith that God desires for us as disciples. That when we pray, we pray with confidence. Let me give you an example. I I can never pray with confidence that my health is always going to be good. I cannot pray that prayer with confidence. I cannot pray with confidence that my prayer, that my, that my health is always going to be good. But what I can pray with unwavering confidence is that what, whatever my health, I can, I can please God. I can't pray with confidence that I'm always going to be healthy. That's foolish. I can't pray that confidently. Listen, I don't care how good your health is. My experience has been in nearly 30 years as a pastor, 33 years of ministry, is that there is an unwavering statistic that I've found to be true. One out of one will die. I've always found that to be true. One out of one will die. So I don't pray with confidence that I'm always going to have good health. But I can pray believing, as Jesus says here. I can pray believing with confidence, regardless of my health, regardless of my circumstances, I may please God. That's what Jesus wants for us. That's what he wanted for those disciples then. He wants us to have this kind of robust faith. This kind of faith that sells well in the world in which we are placed. This kind of faith that is confident. This kind of faith that sees in a a big picture beyond the circumstances that it's a faith that prays 
with expectancy. And if you don't, well, all you're left with is religion. And most assuredly then, you're barking up the wrong tree. Let's pray together. Father, we know that we're called to be a visionary people. A people who think in terms of possibilities beyond circumstances. That look beyond obstacles to opportunities. That see beyond problems to possibilities. To be a people that that have the kind of confidence that sees beyond our present circumstances. That believe that that believes that it's only as we go out into our respective world with a sense of expectancy that you can best use us to, to transform the world in which we find ourselves. Father, I pray that as we open this altar this morning, as we enter into our time of, of personal decision, that if there's anyone here this morning or watching that, that has never committed their life to you, that has never embraced Jesus as, as Lord, Master, and Savior, that has never entered into this journey of faith, that, Lord, this might be their moment, that this might be their opportunity when they step forward in, in that first step, just that first step of faith, and embark upon this journey of discovering what you would have in store for them. Father, I pray that this might be their day of salvation. For others, Lord, that already know you but, but don't have a church home, Father, I pray that, that as your spirit moves them and stirs them, they would come and, and join us as a church family, as a body and community of believers. A church that, that has embraced the admonition of, of being an army marching out into our, our world to be your presence. But Father, we each one during this time, we don't want to leave here the same as, as when we entered. We want our hearts and our minds to be renewed, transformed, and encouraged as we go out into this world and pour our energies into being the people you have called us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For more information, give us a call or visit us online at firstlubbock.org. Check out our other worship times, Sundays at 8.15 or 11 a.m. Experience these online or come visit us at Broadway and Avenue V in Lubbock. Download our mobile app to experience even more from First Lubbock. Thanks for watching. God bless and have a great week.